Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to uh, today's uh, Grand Round uh, presentation. Uh, we have uh, Linda Carpenter uh, from uh, Brown University presenting today. Uh, Dr. Carpenter is a graduate of uh, University of Pennsylvania. University of Michigan undergrad, University of Pennsylvania Medical School, and completed internship and uh, residency at Yale, and is now, and, and since 97, has been at, uh, at Brown University, where she directs the uh, Mood Clinical Program and also the Mood Research Program, and has been conducting research in uh, treatment of refractory depression across many different modalities, including medications and also uh, many different types of devices. So, welcome, Linda. Thank you so much for having me here. It's been such an, um, a nice opportunity to see an amazing um, academic setting with so many resources. Uh, looked, saw your MRI center yesterday and was just drooling with envy at all the amazing things that you have here and the, pe the great people doing good work. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation. And I know you've heard some about that before because you have some people who are doing really great TMS work here. So I'm, going to, I'm not going to spend too much time um, giving you kind of the basics of the story, but I'm going to try to move into sort of the newer areas where technology is um, growing TMS, uh, what else are we learning with TMS, how we can help our patients with it, and with um, technologies related to TMS. I want to start off with um, my disclosures. Um, I act as a consultant for MagStim. This must be one of those ones that doesn't read. Well, we will point. So I act as a consultant to MagStim, and they make TMS equipment for research, and then recently uh, got an FDA approval for treatment of depression. Um, I have research support from various <clears throat> companies that have devices that um, uh, are in development for treatment of depression, and my hospital has contracts with them to conduct clinical trials. That would be Neosync, Cerevel, Neurotech. Thank you very much. Where did you get that to work? I turned it on. Yes. <laughs> That's why he's the technical guy. <laughs> And uh, I've also been supported uh, by Neuronetics to do vagus nerve stimulation study, Medtronic to do deep brain stimulation study. So the story in neuromodulation for psychiatry happens to begin in depression. And I think most people here are in the Department of Psychiatry or related to behavioral health and know why that is the case. Um, the case is because with our best available treatments, and these are data from 3,000 people in the STARDI study, we get about a third of people better if we give them the good perspective ratings and the right dose, a high enough dose for a high enough period of time. And about two-thirds of them remain symptomatic. And if you keep taking those two-thirds of people people and put them through the next best treatment, the next best treatment, the next best treatment we have. At the end of the day, we still have about a third of people who are not better. Um, and not, a, not that that's so much different than it might be with any other chronic major health dis uh, mental health disorder. But it is the case that the disability related to depression is enormous. These are uh, 2014 World Health Organization statistics. And you can see the leading cause of, um, of a loss, years lost due to disability in the world for both male and females is uh, unipolar depressive disorders. And, and the depression associated, or the, the disability associated with this is ranked so high that it's in the same category as quadriplegia and terminal cancer. Um, so, so it's a very common disorder, a very disabling disorder. And for many, many years, um, we've had trouble figuring out how to, how to treat depression, right? We've known that there's, um, that it's a, an or that has to do with the brain. And uh, for the first, you know, part of this uh, century, um, We've been trying to treat uh, TMS with psychotherapy, and in fact, psychotherapy is a proven treatment for many forms of depression and, and makes changes in the brain that can be observed with imaging. And then maybe about 50 years or so ago, there was a real shift for psychiatrists to, to really approach the brain as, as one that's sort of like a bag of chemicals, you know, with Prozac and some of the others. We had patients thinking, oh, my serotonin level is low in my brain. I'm down a quart. I need some serotonin. And so lots and lots of antidepressants really have become the mainstay of treatment for depression. 
But more recently, we've really started to try to capitalize on this notion that the brain is an electrical organ, right? And that it has uh, circuits and networks, and that these can be harnessed or manipulated to treat depression. And so now, it's delightful to think that in the world of psychiatry, we have words um, like neuromodulation and neurostimulation which apply to um, the things that we are doing, interventions we are having to understand the brain and to treat the brain, and using uh, energy sources like electricity and electromagnetism and magnetics. There are other energy sources too, but those are the, the ones that have really uh, come into play and that we'll talk about today. Now, there's some history. It's, even though it sounds like this is a new thing for psychiatry, um, use of electricity and electromagnetic fields has been around for a long time. As early as 1806, ferritization was being used for, uh, by Duchenne de Boulogne, and uh, we have here in 1871 uh, using uh, electricity to treat medical and surgical problems. So a long time ago, and even uh, World War I era in psychiatry, there's a, a device I found called the Bergonic Chair, which was used to give general electrical treatments for psychological problems and neurosis, and I think shell shock is uh, something that they used to treat. But of course, the real story with neuromodulation for psychiatry begins with electroconvulsive therapy. And electroconvulsive therapy is still considered by many the gold standard for treatment of depression when other treatments won't work, or when depression is severe and life-threatening, uh, when somebody might imminently die from their depression. And as many of you know, one of the reasons that a lot of patients don't access ECT is because of the stigma that's associated with it. Many people feel it's very primitive or barbaric. You're applying electricity to the head through electrodes by a little stimulating device or paddles. And basically, you're inducing a seizure, uh, a seizure that you can measure with elect recording electrodes on the head. And if the person didn't have a modern anesthesia, an airway control, and a muscle relaxant drug on board, they would, in fact, be flailing and having a, a, a generalized tonic-clonic seizure um, when they're getting this treatment. And this is a treatment that, um, that helps many, many people, but it also comes with side effects. And most notably, there are side effects related to memory deficits. Um, it's, it's not a treatment that everybody can access. It has to be in a, in a hospital setting, um, and it's typically given uh, two or three times a week. So you're basically inducing a seizure in the brain. You can see that. You can see the seizure stops. And if it's at least 30 seconds of brain seizure activity, that's considered an adequate treatment. But because of the stigma and because of the side effects, such as uh, cognitive side effects, um, people have uh, been interested in, in trying to find another way to get as good a treatment as we do with ECT, but not having to use the whole anesthesia and sedation and airway monitoring and, and having those cognitive side effects. And one of the reasons that we're inspired to go after this is because ECT works. These are some uh, data from sham controlled uh, trials. They're quite a bit older, but um, these are robust findings. Anything on this side of the line uh, shows that the effect comparing sham and active ECT favored ECT for depression. So it's a treatment that works. And if we could figure out how to get to the brain without having to use electricity that goes everywhere, then that might be a way we could get um, the, the same robust antidepressant effect. Well, the next device that uh, came to through the regulatory process in psychiatry and got FDA approval is vagus nerve stimulation. And I'm sort of curious to know if there's anyone in the audience that treats patients with vagus nerve stimulation. A few, okay, and, and maybe for epilepsy because it's uh, FDA approved for epilepsy first and was being used in uh, trials of, with patients who had epilepsy and there was a, a hotel clerk in Gainesville, Florida who who would uh, um, greet the patients every time they came back every three months for their follow-up assessments in the seizure studies. Uh, with vagus nerve stimulation, and he noticed and remarked to the investigators, gee, I don't know what you're doing, but these people get nicer and happier every time I see them. And the investigators sort of went, huh, I wonder if there's some effect on mood. Um, and so they started prospectively evaluating mood symptoms, and these weren't patients with depression, they were patients with epilepsy, but they noticed that over time, even if seizures weren't being reduced by vagus nerve stimulation, that uh, mood was improving. So that's how it made its jump to uh, treatment-resistant depression. But this is basically a device that's like an implanted battery pack there, like a pulse generator in your uh, chest wall and tunneled through the chest wall with coils wrapped around the left vagus nerve. And 80% of the fibers of the vagus nerve carry messages up to the brain through the solitary tract nucleus, which goes to a number of other areas in the brain that are implicated in, in uh, mood and emotion regulation and depression. 
So this is a treatment. I was actually a principal investigator on many of these studies. Uh, this is a, a fairly easy 30 to one hour, 30 minutes to one hour surgical procedure. And here you can just sort of see the pathway from the vagus nerve in your left neck. We don't do it on the right because those branches go to the, the heart, but the left uh, ones uh, go right up to solitary tract nucleus and then um, into this real network. And beyond that, how it works is not really well known. We do know that uh, that the vagus nerve has um, more recently have learned has a very interesting and intimate feedback loop with the peripheral immune system. So that may be one of the ways that it works well for um, depression, but um, really don't understand how it works for uh, epilepsy or for depression. But anyway, a number of, of uh, trials were conducted, and this uh, treatment made its way through the FDA and is now approved for treatment-resistant depression. But as you may notice from the number of people that raise their hand, there are not many patients out there who have it. It's not covered by any insurances or Medicare or Medicaid. Um, they generally thought that the quality of the data were not adequate to support its use because uh, once the study was randomized, half the patients got sham and half of them got active treatment. Um, at the end of three months, there really was no difference. And the, the, the reason that it ever became FDA approved is because uh, there were naturalistic data. You had all these patients with devices in them and the investigators started turning them on and tweaking. And eventually over time, you could see that there was evidence that this group was getting better gradually over time, over a year, compared to other patients like them that were equally as sick. So they decided there's an unmet need. The FDA approved it, but it really hasn't taken off because um, the data weren't so strong, insurance companies don't pay for it. And besides which, um, you know, there's a lot of patients who will get this device implanted and then if it doesn't work for them, they're stuck with hardware in their body. And it's a problem because with the coils around the neck, um, you really can't get an MRI if you bust your knee or something. And so um, that's, a, that's a disadvantage. We don't want to be implanting hardware in people and then have them be stuck with it when it's not helping and then become a problem for them. And that's the same thing we run into with deep brain stimulation. Now, just as an aside, before we talk about TMS, I wanted to bring your attention that there's a whole other generation of vagus nerve stimulators that are external. And those uh, make contact with some uh, sensory locations in your ear, which, have, uh, which are branches of the vagus nerve, and they will conduct the electrical signals right uh, through to the solitary tract uh, without having to be under the skin and, and surgically implanted. So that's something that's in development, and we'll watch that. They've just started to have their first um, pivotal uh, pilot trials. So we have ECT, and we had VNS, and ECT is considered our gold standard, and VNS is sort of came and went. It's, there's a few people out there. I follow maybe 50 people who had the device in for, for uh, clinical trial protocols, but I think I also lead the country in the number of patients who had it explanted because it didn't work. So the next sort of um, source of energy is the one that might have some real advantages because it's non-invasive. It's not implanted hardware. You're not stuck with it. And this has to do with electromagnetic fields. Now, <clears throat> there's Faraday's laws of physics that tell us if you pulse, uh, <clears throat> if you pulse an electrical field, sorry, <clears throat> if you pulse a magnetic field in one direction, you'll induce a current in a perpendicular plane, right? And so, <clears throat> <clears throat> sorry, this concept is is um, is used in transcranial magnetic stimulation. So what we're looking at here is something we call a coil. And I know you've all been introduced to this before, but I'll quickly review it. So you've got windings and windings of copper wire, something that conducts electricity. And you shoot electrical uh, electricity through the coil, and as it's shooting through the coil in a pulsed fashion, it's going to create a magnetic field, right? So the magnetic field comes off of that. And the magnetic field penetrates the brain, unlike electricity, which when you apply it here for ECT, it, it, it goes through your tissue, your scalp, and your skull in the, in the cracks in the cranium and then randomly all over the place as it spreads in the cortex. Unlike that, magnetic energy goes unimpeded through your scalp and skull tissues. So it's sort of a point and shoot. You get to deliver it where you're, where you're directing it and rather than having it spread everywhere. So magnetic energy goes into the brain um, and induces current in the brain because the brain is like electrical wire. It can conduct electricity. So you're actually inducing currents in neural tissues. And again, there's some history with this. This goes back quite a ways. The first time that we know anybody applying this to central nervous system is 1910. Not that long ago, uh, but 100 years ago. And uh, there he's applying uh, uh, electromagnetic field to retina to uh, visualize phosphines, which is not unlike what happens when we do motor threshold. I'll talk about that. So here's kind of the units of how this breaks out. So you're putting electricity through your coil, right? And that's making a magnetic field that looks the same. 
and the magnetic field is a pulse, so it's got a rate of change, and that induces electricity in the brain. And then now you've got your cortical neurons where the tissue um, has current that's traveling, and that leads to the behavioral effects. One of the ways we figure out the dose of TMS for, for treatment or how to use it when we're applying it for research experiments is to figure out how much magnetic energy is needed to make one neuron fire in your brain. And the best way we can do this is by going over a strip of the brain called the motor cortex. That's right there. We all have this strip in our brain called primary motor cortex. And it's organized in a way that is represented in this uh, picture, which we call a homunculus, a little man. So if I'm standing and, and stimulating this spot, I can probably uh, get the, um, the stimulation to excite a neuron that will be represented by a twitch in the contralateral hand. And if I were stimulating um, down here further, which would be sort of down here, I could get uh, muscles in the, in the larynx to, to contract, to, be, to uh, be activated by stimulating a neuron up there. And that's because there, we have these these pathways that um, motor neurons take until they get to the muscles. So what we do is you can either use a visual looking at a person's hand or you can set up a little electrode and monitor for muscle movement and, and apply a pulse right over that motor strip with your coil. And so I can apply a weak one and nothing happens and a weak one and nothing happens and now a stronger one and a strong one and eventually I'll apply one and I'll get a twitch just like that. And when I get a twitch in a finger or a hand, whatever I'm targeting, uh, assume that I'm targeting for the purposes of this discussion, that little spot right there, then I can say, okay, it takes that much energy to make one of your cortical neurons fire in the motor strip. We're going to call that the motor threshold. And so now every time I give a treatment, I'm going to calibrate it against that number, right? So if I want to give a, a really strong treatment, I might go 120% of the motor threshold when I go to stimulate the front part of your brain. Um, if I were going to stimulate that motor area over and over and over, I wouldn't want to keep going at 100% because I would keep stimulating all the muscles and that could produce a seizure. So I might go less than 100% of the motor threshold. And so we have like units of resting motor threshold when we talk about the dose of TMS. And in common clinical practice now with the FDA, the first FDA approved device, which um, is shown here, uh, the treatment for depression is six weeks of treatment, five days a week, and the target is the left prefrontal cortex area. And this is a strong field. It's about a 1.5 Tesla stimulation field. And it goes quickly, 10 pulses per second, 10 hertz. And that's excitatory. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. This is an outpatient procedure. And you can see here that when you deliver this TMS to this front area of the brain, it's not only going to impact the front area of the brain, but it also is going to go deeper to deeper circuits and on both sides of the brain. So it's not like you're just trying to go after that one little spot. And so this was FDA approved the first device in 2008 uh, following some clinical trials. And I will very quickly review these because there's so much more um, interesting updated data. It's hard to believe 2008 was a long time ago. But this company, Neuronetics, uh, it said, OK, well, we think we've got a coil that can do this. And here's some parameters. We're going to stick with those. We're going to do 120% of the motor threshold to the left front of the brain, 10 pulses a second, and for four seconds on, then 26 seconds rest, and 3,000 pulses each time. And they randomized people to an active or a sham condition, right? So the sham condition had a coil, but there was a steel plate underneath it, so none of the magnetic energy could get through and penetrate the brain. But it would sound the same and feel a little bit the same, because maybe 5% of the magnetic field would sort of escape around the edges. And so they did those treatments five days a week, and they evaluated patients at baseline, and they were medication-free, and then after two weeks, four weeks, and six weeks. And, um, and these were all outpatients who were um, moderately uh, ill or worse. And most of them had had many, many, um, in order to be in this trial, you had to have failed multiple antidepressant trials, or at least tried them and not been able to tolerate them. So they had patients who had failed one to four adequate antidepressant trials in the current episode. And that doesn't sound maybe like a lot, but some of the patients who had one adequate antidepressant trial had actually been on 23 different antidepressants. Only one of them met the criteria for a high enough dose in a long enough time. So they, they ran their trial, and they, uh, they had their outcome data. And of course, the, the dark spot here is the, the people who got active, and these are the ones that got sham at 
the ratings at, at baseline, week two, four, and six. The top one is the, the Madras, and the bottom one is the Hamilton. Those are both depression uh, rating scales. And they picked ahead of time uh, that their a priori, that their primary outcome was going to be the Madras. And that's unfortunate because the separation between active and sham on that one was P equals 0.058. And you have to be less than P equals 0.05. It's a little bit random, but you have to say there's no more than 5% chance that you're, that you're getting your results uh, that are spurious and not real. So uh, their other outcome measure, the Madras, separated um, much more significantly, but that's the one they picked. So they had a problem. And they had, of course, categorical response and remission rates comparing active and sham. And those were significant. These are remission rates in that column and each one using a different scale. But it didn't matter because they had said that 0.05 was going to be their primary outcome measure and they didn't meet, it. They didn't meet that goal at less than 0.05. They had a crossover study, so if you got sham for the whole first part of the study, you could keep going and uh, you could get active uh, treatment in the second half of the study. So they had <laughs> results from people who had crossed over from sham to active, and those are their responder rates, 44.7, remission rates about 30-something, uh, depending on which scale you use, 45, 30. And actually, people who continued TMS past six weeks, uh, another third of them got better. But the, the the FDA said, you know, what are we going to do with this? It looks like the treatment worked, but you didn't meet your primary outcome at less than 0.05. So they said, well, why don't you look at your data and see if there's a subset that did better. Um, Neuronetics identified uh, about half of their sample, 164, who had failed only one antidepressant that was adequate in the current episode. They had been on up to, again, I think up to 23 different antidepressants, but one of them counted as adequate. And in this group, they um, were able to demonstrate much, much more robust separation from um, sham and the FDA said, okay, that's good, we'll put it through. And as you may remember, when it first went through, the label said that TMS is indicated for people who have failed one antidepressant trial, and that was really weird because who would do that? Um, but anyway, uh, subsequently they provided more data and were able to revise their label. And now their device and the others that have followed it are all just indicated for patients who have failed antidepressant trials in the current episode. And one of the things that TMS really demonstrated to the world, which was interesting and, and useful to know, is that it didn't have the sort of side effects that medication produced. That's important. The main side effect is that it feels like there's a woodpecker pecking on your head. And even though that sounds really strange, and I've never had a woodpecker peck on my head, and neither have my patients, they all say that. And it, there's this sort of feeling of a, like a something sharp poking at you the first couple of days. It gets softer and softer over time. And by a week or two, people are feeling it like a dull tap, and maybe they even fall asleep. But it, it, it there's some facial twitching when the, when the TMS um, magnetic field is, uh, is, is pulsing, and that's what people feel. And these are easy to manage side effects that go away. And the other thing that TMS showed the world is that it didn't cause cogn cognitive side effects. And that's important, of course, because ECT does have that um, liability. And so they showed that patients uh, who had TMS had, uh, did not have deficits in their cognitive function. And in fact, there's some evidence that their cognitive function improved, even if their depression didn't improve. But that's, a, you know, that's an industry-sponsored trial, and we're all skeptical about those sorts of things, so we would want to see uh, a trial replicated like that. And in fact, uh, our tax dollars through NIH paid for a second trial, a large-scale uh, trial that was done in the group of four researchers uh, who had um, uh, four research sites who had expertise in TMS. And they, uh, the company basically gave them the devices, but were hands-off other than that. They used the same parameters, and uh, they conducted their own trial, and they were able to replicate the results that the uh, Neuronetics had, had shown the world. Um, one of the things they did was they just said, well, we can make an even better sham. We'll put some electrodes on the patient's head so when the thing goes everyone's face will shake equally, and whether or not they've got active or sham, they wouldn't be able to guess. So that was one uh, contribution. But they um, basically uh, replicated the treatment effect, the difference between active and sham treatments with regard to remission. And they had a number of secondary outcome measures that were either self-report or clinician rated, and those also demonstrated uh, antidepressant efficacy. Those are research settings, and then the next question was, well, what happens when you take a, a technology like this out of the, the hands of researchers? What happens in real life practices with, uh, with non-research, non-academic psychiatrists? So we were able to collect some data from uh, naturalistic settings um, and published uh, this. And, and actually, it was nice to see that in the hands of, of uh, people who weren't following a research protocol and using research patients, the outcomes were about the same. Response <laughs> rates about 50, 58 percent maybe a little higher, a little lower, depending on which scale you used. 
Well, so that was the first part of the story, and everyone's like, okay, well, you can get people better, but how long does that last? And that's been an important question and remains an important research focus for us because we want to get people better, and this is an expensive and, and, and time-consuming treatment, but you want to be able to keep them better. The naturalistic data that we collected over a year um, in real-life clinical practices showed that after you finish a TMS, uh, about, th- about two-thirds of people are going to stay in their response status for the rest of the year. So about two-thirds of people do really, really well. About a third require additional treatments. They get booster treatments or start over again and get a whole other round of treatments. Um, and over a year's time when we followed these patients, uh, the mean number of additional treatments that people needed uh, in the year to stay well was about 16 So we had a number of different types of data coming together. The early part of developing TMS was small small clinical trials and then the bigger ones. And together, the the body of evidence was really creating a story that this was an efficacious treatment. And that, of course, led to a number of events, which led to um, the acceptance and really implementation of TMS as a standard of care. The APA got behind it in their their guidelines and said this is a a recommended treatment for treatment-resistant depression. A number of clinics uh, popped up, and many of us were working to advocate for insurance coverage. I know in Rhode Island now, we have all insurers, Medicare, Medicaid, and all commercial insurance. So everybody that gets TMS in my clinic is uh, getting it uh, paid for by their insurance. They may have co-pays, but that's the case now. And so uh, around the country, there are very few areas that don't have Medicare coverage for TMS. Now, one thing that uh, you might remember from the beginning is that the shape and size of the the field, the magnetic field that comes off these coils, depending on how big and how they're wound, impacts the the field of magnetic energy that comes off it. And so uh, one very clever researcher was able to do some modeling that's helpful to us. This is the currently the first FDA-approved one, the Neurostar. You can see that little red dot. That's sort of like the the size and shape of the field that comes off of that. That's the, the... the magnetic field and the current that it's inducing. And then there's some other figure of eight coils, and they all kind of do the same thing. But you'll see up in this top row that there's some very large and, and convoluted uh, complex coils, and that they, the area of red that they, that they show here in the model stimulating is very large across right and left sides of the brain. And <clears throat> those H coils, these are all different coils that are available to deliver magnetic energy. And so this area of coils was... Um, was the one that was used by a company called Brainsway. This is the windings of their coil that gives a magnetic energy field, and it's, it fits inside a helmet like this. And they had data. They conducted their own clinical trials and had data and went to FDA and got FDA approved. And I know there are multiple of these Brainsway deep TMS devices here um, in your institution. These are the clinical trial data that they generated. They did 20 treatments five days a week, and then they started spreading them out two a week for the rest of it. And they had response and remission rates, uh, responder rates a a little lower at at their five-week outcome, remission rates about a third, but very significant effects compared to sham. And in general, when you look at TMS um, efficacy data, you might go, gosh, there's a really low response or remission rates. Am I supposed to get excited about 30% of patients getting better? But what you need to keep in mind is these are patients who have failed multiple antidepressant trials. And typically when a new drug comes out, you look at Brintilix or Fetzima, they're not going to allow patients like this into a clinical trial because it's much harder to get them better. You have to look at the STAR-D data where you say, well, what happens after, how likely are we to get people better after they've had four treatments? And in fact, after they've had about four treatments, the best we can see with any drug is about 10 or 11% of responders. So <clears throat> when you put that in context, these outcomes become more meaningful. And of course, that's why we compare them with sham. Since those two FDA-approved devices, uh, the Neuronetics, Neurostar, and the Brainsway Deep TMS, two more companies have come along with their devices and said, hey, we're generally equivalent to those other two. FDA, why don't you give us approval? They didn't have to do their own trials, but uh, the first of these was MagStim. This is a company that's made uh, devices for research use for a long, long time. And the next was MagVenture. Their their device is called MagVita. So now we have four FDA-approved devices for the treatment of uh, depression, and that's great. Some of them are are much less expensive to use than others. And there's a, a number of new things in development. There are TMS devices that are used to map your tumor before you have surgery if you have a a brain tumor. And some of the new devices that are under investigation are combining stimulation with a task based on the idea that there might be some state-dependent 
um, enhancement of learning or cognitive function. So this is a, a device that's being in, in large-scale clinical trials in the U.S. now for early Alzheimer's. And basically what's happening is this patient is getting stimulation, and while they're getting stimulation, they're doing a working memory task on a screen, sort of like Lumosity, uh, some of those little games that people play online. And they have some very exciting early data um, for the ability to slow the progression of Alzheimer's or in some cases even improve working memory in these populations. So the question then becomes, well, how can we make this even better? What other therapeutic areas can we go into? And some people have thought maybe you could make it better if you had more precise targeting of exactly the spot in the brain you want to go to. And that's sort of been an important question. Well, where would you stimulate for schizophrenia? Where would you stimulate for Parkinson's? Where should we put the, the coil for PTSD? And it's, it's not like in cardiology where you can say, okay, well, there's the blockage. I'm going to go in there with my stent. We really don't know. Um, where you know the optimal site is, and it might be different for each patient that has the same disorder. Really, the brain works in networks and circuits, and so it's not as simple as one spot. If you go in and cut that out, or 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 excite, turn it on or turn it off, then that'll fix you. So people have tried neuronavigation, where they take uh, MRI pictures of the brain and upload them into a. Um, a software system so that when they put the coil on the head, they can see exactly in that person's brain what area of the brain you're stimulating. And they've looked at that as maybe a way to enhance the outcomes for depression, but they haven't really panned out as something um, very helpful. Maybe we need to give more pulses. When we first started this back in 1997, the total number of stimuli per session was really low, and the number of, of stimuli per week, and, and now in more recent years, we've really increased. You know, I think at the beginning, IRBs and investigators were like, oh, you know, the smoke going to start coming out of their ears soon. And as we've had more comfort with the safety of this, <clears throat> people have been much more aggressive with dosing depression. I think you'll see that happen with some of the other therapeutic areas like stroke in the years to come. The other thing is, <clears throat> well, how should those pulses be delivered? It turns out it really matters. Now there are devices that can give little bundles of pulses over 200 milliseconds. It's packaging little bundles, and we call that theta burst, and you might have heard about that because theta burst stimulation has been compared to regular pulses with our standard FDA-approved protocols, and it does about the same for depression, but instead of taking 37 minutes for a treatment, it takes six minutes for a treatment. So that would be certainly more convenient. You could treat more people in the same amount of time, and there's a lot of interest in exploring this. What else besides depression? Well, there are infinite number of um, disorders and conditions influenced by the human brain, of course. And some of the things we know about what TMS does relate to the chemicals that are, are released and circulating, the neuro, neurotransmitters. So we know that dopamine and GABA are both released by neurons um, following TMS. And this has been harnessed in a number of studies that look at um, potential uh, therapeutic benefit for people with substance use disorders. The data I have here um, represent a randomized controlled trial for people who are smoking and nicotine dependent who have failed to get better with other therapies. And <clears throat> the goal here was, well, we're going to use low-frequency inhibitory stimulation to an area of the brain because we think that that will turn off the brain's activity related to craving when somebody first quits smoking. So what they did is they uh, applied it to the right area of the brain based on some of their uh, imaging data suggesting that would be a, a good side to go for um, craving. And patients stopped smoking. And on the day they stopped smoking, they got a nicotine patch, but they also got TMS or sham. So they got TMS five days a week for two weeks. And they also assessed craving. They assessed craving at the beginning, after two weeks, after four weeks, and after six weeks and 12 weeks. And what they found is that at the end of two weeks, the number of patients who remained abstinence from cigarettes were much higher if they had had the active TMS rather than the sham. Keeping in mind, they all have nicotine therapy, all the same 21 milligram patch. But then after uh, they stopped giving those treatments, the follow-ups at week six and week 12, the, there was no difference. So it, hadn't, it, it had kept them better during those weeks while they were getting the extra treatment, but they probably stopped a little bit too soon. Two weeks is probably not enough. Who knows, maybe had they kept going, they would have improved uh, abstinence from cigarettes. They also found a number of, of changes related to how people reported their craving for nicotine. And here they found changes that were significant for those who had active TMS, but they didn't quite meet significance over time for those who had shams. So some palpable evidence that uh, the TMS was affecting the areas of the brain involved in craving in a, in a, in a lasting way, even though the uh, abstinence didn't pan out as well. 
Another area that is of uh, interest for TMS is schizophrenia. And some researchers have targeted specific types of symptoms, like, oh, I might put the target, the, the coil here and try to do some excitatory stimulation if I want to treat negative symptoms, or maybe they want to put it here and try to do inhibitory for auditory hallucinations. So there have been a number of different sort of stimulation sites and protocols tried. There was a recent um, review of these uh, randomized controlled trials uh, published last year, and they found that the temporal parietal junction area, um, which had been studied in seven randomized controlled trials, indeed uh, demonstrated efficacy over sham for, um, for overall uh, schizophrenia, sort of a global mental health measure. And these are represented here in a, uh, a plot with effect sizes. These are different measures that are used, the BPRS and the PANS. And um, for positive symptoms, five studies had specifically targeted positive symptoms. And again, significant effects were found when you put all of those studies together, too. That's in 127 patients. And these five uh, or seven trials in, with temporal parietal junction, they uh, represent 224 patients. So lots of small studies that people are doing. And we often put them together in these meta-analyses to try to get a, a bigger signal. Does it look like... Um, that this is worth going in a big, big way because you would need a large, large amount of money, a big federal grant or an industry sponsor to do a, a, a trial with um, hundreds of patients. So often these uh, meta-analyses are helpful at, at giving us an idea about what works. There is an FDA-approved product for migraine. This is uh, called um, the e -Nura. And this is a device that's portable, and a person can pack it up in their handbag. When they start to get an aura, which signals an oncoming migraine, they can bring it out, charge it up, pop it on the back of their head like that, and deliver three TMS pulses. And this is now an FDA-approved product. There's a great interest in using TMS for depression in populations that you really don't want to give psychotropic medications to. Pregnant women, postpartum mothers who are nursing, children, um, people who have other um, medical contraindications for taking antidepressants. And the, some pilot data uh, have been published. This is one of several studies in postpartum depression showing very, very robust antidepressant effects, and there are now ongoing large-scale, double-blind, sham controlled trials. Um, so that's an area that uh, I think that we'll eventually see an indication for. People are, uh, researchers are reluctant to, to do any studies in pregnant women. Um, you know, we all, if you're a pregnant woman, you really love the benefit of having sham controlled data to show you safety and efficacy of something, but for a variety of reasons, um, being the first one to, to deliver a new treatment to a pregnant woman is uh, something, a risk that many institutions and researchers are reluctant to, to engage in. And so we end, up having, um, we end up having kind of roundabout data, and many pregnant women do get TMS even though they don't have those controlled data. One of the things that we've also wanted to do is understand, well, how does TMS work? And I think I explained to you, it's not just stimulating this one area underneath the coil, but it's stimulating all over areas of the brain. And we've learned how different pulse frequencies have different effects on the brain. So when you pulse very fast, that's excitatory. And that uh, leads to increases in a number of areas of the brain bilaterally, even though you're applying the stimulation on one side, in the prefrontal cortex, cingulate gyrus, uh, the basal ganglia, hippocampus, Parahippocampus, and when you apply very slow stimulation, that's got an inhibitory effect. Like I said, the, the smoking research used that to kind of turn down neural activity in the areas that they thought would be firing for craving. So we have a number of different types of evidence of that. And, and here's another one where you see these dark lines. This is left and right side of the brain. The darkest line is, is pulses that are given at five per second, five hertz, right? And then you have the next line is at two hertz, and there's at one hertz. And you can see the different levels of uh, blood flow and activation depend on those. Um, some people have, have tried low frequency stimulation in patients with depression, and certainly we've all observed that when you give slow pulses to a patient, they have this very sort of uh, anxiolytic feeling. They get real chill. It's like you've just given them a Valium. And, and it's used as a protocol in depression often. Sometimes people do the left side, and that doesn't work at the fast 10 hertz. They'll go over to the right side and do that slow. Meta-analyses have started to look at the randomized controlled trials that use slow treatment on the right side. And whether it's left or right is just a little arbitrary. It, uh, it really is sort of a, a random thing that it started that way. Researchers, for convenience, had two coils, one here and one here, and so they did fast on the left and slow on the front. But some people think that it relates to the fact that some of the early imaging studies in depression showed that, um, that the left side of the brain was 
hypoperfused compared to the right. There was this asymmetry with regard to the activity and perfusion of those areas of the brain. So maybe they were sort of trying to tune up the area that was sluggish and, and slow down the area that seemed excessively active in depression. But these are, uh, this is a meta-analysis of studies that have used one hertz treatments for depression. And, and in fact, they, in a meta-analysis, there are a number of small studies, but um, this now represents 263 patients in eight controlled trials. And this is highly significant effect for treatment of depression. So we have some options. And this works particularly well in patients who have a high anxiety component. Now, many people want to know about bipolar depression. I get bipolar patients who are in a terrible depressive episode referred all the time, and I'm sure your TMS clinics here do too. But we really don't know how best to treat bipolar depression. And there's a significant risk for inducing mania or uh, switching somebody into a mixed state with regular high-frequency left-sided treatment. In fact, I did that with one of my first few TMS patients not knowing it was somebody with bipolar depression. And I have never treated a bipolar patient since then. Um, and often the docs will say, oh, this person isn't really truly bipolar. They're mostly depressed. They're mostly the same. They need to change the diagnosis. But um, there is this risk. And we've never, ever had a, a, a large-scale, randomized clinical trial with bipolar depression because we really don't know how best to do it, how safely to do it. We have some case series and some open-label data, some naturalistic data like this. And in all these cases, uh, they're used, to, the, the treatment, the TMS stimulation is given together with mood stabilizers to protect against um, switching into a manic state. TMS, because it can excite or inhibit neural activity, is also being um, used in stroke uh, rehabilitation. You can either take the injured hemisphere and try to give it high frequency excitatory stimulation. That's considered a little bit risky because of uh, the instability of that tissue and the risk for inducing a seizure. Or you can take the side that works and try to inhibit it, the side of the brain that's not injured, and try to kind of turn it off so the other side will um, grow and develop and do it concurrently with physical therapy um, as a sort of an augmentation. And so this is something that's an early in its area of research, and I believe some of that work is being done here. I think over time you'll see the doses of uh, uh, treatment increase as uh, people are, are studying how best to use TMS for post-stroke rehabilitation. In Parkinson's disease, people have tried stimulating all over the brain, right? It's a movement disorder, uh, but would you stimulate the motor cortex or would you stimulate the frontal cortex? There are studies that have stimulated for Parkinson's all over the place. Um, one of the most recent ones done with a deep TMS does go right on top of that motor cortex. And, and they have to, because they're right there, they have to bring it down to a very weak level compared to how much energy it takes for the motor threshold to get a, a, a neurons to fire. So uh, they go at about 80% <clears throat> of the motor threshold, or actually this one I think was done at 100% of the motor threshold um, with the deep TMS coil, and they did both primary motor strip and a bi bilateral um, prefrontal regions. And this is open-label data, but these are actually scores on um, Parkinson's movement symptoms. This is not depression data. These are um, early evidence, and there's a large evolving field how uh, TMS can be used to treat Parkinson's. One of the things that's been explored is how, you know, whether we can use two coils, there's two at the same time to go deeply to, to keep the, the field and focus it in a certain uh, location. This is a company that ran a clinical trial that I'm just now writing up the results, but they, there was a depression trial and they were effective uh, separating the active from the sham using this device. One of the most exciting and interesting things that I think is out there is based on your own personalized brain messages to us about how to stimulate. And that is through use of an EEG, which is like putting EKG on, little electrodes, and reading your brain's alpha rhythm. Turns out we all have an endogenous signature, which is our brain's individual alpha frequency, somewhere between 8 and 12 hertz, if you look at an EEG. So this is that. So I might be chugging along at 8 hertz, and Dr. Lim might be chugging along at 10 hertz, and you might be at 12 hertz. And so the concept here is based on some data, some EEG data, that compared healthy people with people with depression. And they found the abnormalities between the two groups, which are represented as these red marks here, um, were very much represented in alpha frequencies, these rhythms of oscillations of neurons at 8 or 10 or 12 hertz or anything in between. Um, that, that uh, went kind of from the front area of the brain to the back area of the brain. And based on that, and the idea of like, how does TMS work? Well, maybe it works 
by entraining these rhythms that are abnormal in depressed patients, represented here. And what they found, those abnormalities were like hypersynchronous rhythms, sort of like ventricular tachycardia of these alpha rhythms from the front to the back of the head. And they thought, well, maybe it works because TMS entrains those neural oscillations, those rhythms get, they get forced into a, a regular 10 hertz uh, sort of um, firing and cycling. And then when you stop, it's sort of like stretch the rubber band and it resets the, the, the cortex's own oscillating rhythms to a more natural, natural state. And so this was the, um, the abnormality in depression, this hypersynchrony, and then this is the normal state, which is a highly variable, fluid sort of uh, oscillation of these rhythms. <clears throat> so this company made a device, and instead of shooting electricity through a coil, they have three rotating uh, magnetic cylinders, like those buckyballs, neodymium, boron, rare earth magnets. And they rotated them around, and they synchronized it with the patient's own alpha frequency. And what they found when they synchronized it um, in, a, in a very um, well sham controlled trial, because patients couldn't tell if the things in there were magnets or just metal, is that this was a safe and effective treatment. And what's really cool about this, not only does it match up with your individual alpha frequency, and we found that people treated who are not on their individual alpha frequency did worse, but this is a very weak field, and this is a device that's being developed as a take home device. And so when this goes to FDA in a few years, it'll be a device that patients use at home. So I want to leave some time to take your questions. There's so much more that I could talk about. This is our TMS clinic in uh, Butler Hospital where I practice. We have a couple of the Neurostar devices that are going full time every day and then <clears throat> some other research devices. But I think that there's this, there's a myriad of, of, of new kinds of pilot data out there with new devices and new therapeutic indications and new bits of science that sort of tell us how to deliver magnetic energy to the brain, either in a strength or a pulse or a location or a depth um, that will be uh, smarter or perhaps more effective or more useful for another sort of disorder. The indications that now TMS are being uh, examined in range from smoking cessation to obesity to rheumatic brain injury and major chronic psychiatric disorders. And we don't really know what, what else will be down the road. I think there are many, many possibilities. So thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take your questions at this point. And we have eight minutes left. Questions for Dr. Carpenter? Yeah, so we are actually in the last uh, three patients of a PTSD trial that we're doing right now in, at Brown in Providence, Rhode Island. And um, <clears throat> it's, um, it's been an open question about what, how fast or slow you should stimulate, right? So, um, you know, for people who have very active um, startle and flashbacks and so forth, um, maybe this slower pulsing and more anxiolytic sorts of stimulation is better, but people have also tried some very fast excitatory stimulation. Um, we're wrapping up a trial that had 30 people with biomarker data and imaging before and after, and, um, and it, it, it certainly looks like it works. Um, I think what we can see right now is that there are two types of patients who we all treat with PTSD. Some of them had early life traumas and have been chronically ill for decades and decades and decades with sort of a, you know, a chronic um, smoldering version of TMS that releases traumas. And then we have other people who had generally healthy brains as adults and then went to combat and have acute onset and, and PTSD. And it really looks like it works very well for military combat PTSD that develops in, in adulthood. Less well, although not, not, uh, not at all for people who have chronic uh, smoldering symptoms since childhood. But certainly, you know, if you think about the brain early in development and making its connections when some of those childhood traumas happen, that is a, a different background for trying to bring about recovery than an adult who had a healthy brain and then um, sees a trauma and, and develops PTSD. So it looks very promising for adult onset PTSD, and I think we're still going to keep working it out for people with chronic uh, PTSD. I have a question about yeah. uh, issues about localization or where where to actually stimulate. <clears throat> um, and we've been faced with some of the issues in some of our studies uh, in clinical practice about inducing anxiety, some some uh, increase in anxiety while treating for depression. Yeah. And whether there are multiple stimulation strategies. Is yeah. that something that... Uh, you know, the thing that happens is that in these large-scale 
regulatory trials, patients are all medication-free, right? And so you get these great data, and then you, you get the device in in your real-life practice, and the people come to you are, are on 10 medications, right? The, the, two antidepressants, maybe some Seroquel, PRN, some Benzos PRN, some stimulants, maybe some Cytomel too. That's not an unusual regimen for somebody coming to TMS, and all that is not working. And you say, oh, you know, um, I, I, that's a lot of medicine. We're going to stimulate on top of that. And they really feel like they can't give up any of those things. So when you start stimulating, the first couple of days, nothing happens. But after about three, four, or five days, there are increases in plasticity in the brain. Synapses working better. Circuits are turning on. And all of a sudden, the side effects of medications are amplified. So if people are taking stimulants, they'll come back the next day and be like, man, I felt like I had a pot of coffee after my treatment yesterday, and I couldn't fall asleep. And so the first thing we have to do is just back off those and stop those medications. And then that resolves the problem. And you keep on going, keep on going. And maybe they'll come in a week later and you're like, ah, oh, starting to feel kind of fatigued. And then it's like, okay, well, now it's time to back off those Ativan PRNs. And that usually resolves the problem. Like, oh, good, I feel good. And you go on. And, and this is excitatory stimulation. Sometimes we have to drop from 10 hertz to 5 hertz because we just keep, can't keep going. It's too excitatory. And people start developing what they'll say is either anxiety or irritability or some insomnia. And it's, a, it's basically an interaction of the, the TMS with medications. Um, medications become, if you imagine, you know, you're taking 200 milligrams of Zoloft and now you do the stimulation, it's sort of like acting like 400 or 600 milligrams of Zoloft and it really potentiates the effect of CNS active drugs, not just antidepressants, benzos, and stimulants, but also uh, patients who are on opioids like Suboxone or Methadone and marijuana effects. Those are sort of anecdotal observations with a lot of patients. So we do have to do some of that. I mean, in an ideal world, you'd say, well, come off all these treatments before we start, but you really don't know if you're going to get them better, and you don't want to make them worse before you start. So some of that uh, sort of stop. And the other strategy that people use is they start to space out the treatments a little bit. Um, that will often help things quiet down. Too much on top of each other can just be overstimulating. But the, the model that the insurance companies uh, will pay for, it follows very closely what the clinical trials did. So you don't have a lot of space. They give you a window from here to here to get all your treatments done. If you start putting a couple days in between them, often um, you will run into some troubles with coverage. One last question here. Yes, yes. Actually, there's some really great pilot data that have been done by Shirlene Sampson um, here in uh, Minnesota uh, at Mayo Clinic with adolescents with pain disorders and with adolescents with depression. And based on those pilot data and a pressing need for something for adolescents, uh, the company Neuronetics that made the first device has now launched a large-scale sham-controlled trial in adolescents with depression. Now, um, that's a great thing. What's unfortunate is that the enrollment and recruitment is terribly sluggish because trying to get adolescents medication-free who would be willing to sit and get a treatment five days a week for six weeks that could be a sham is, is really a hurdle for adolescents. You know, they have to be driven there by somebody often and um, have lives like school and so forth. So, um, so uh, enrollment is sluggish, but there are sites around the country, if you know adolescents that might like to participate in something like that, you could certainly um, contact the company and find out where one of the 20 clinical trial sites is. But that's, that's a, really important, um, a really important need, and I know I'm, I'm a co-investigator in a trial that's using TMS for um, adolescent impulsivity using a different sort of uh, stimulation protocol than the, the depression one, but... Um, there's definitely a population that needs some alternatives. Linda, thank you thank so you. much. Thank you. You have been dis-